my name, you mean? How, yeah. how I say? Yeah. Yeah, Kit. Kit. Yeah. Kvulvalsen. Kvulvalsen. Is that yeah. right? It's not. Kit. Yeah, it's not. That you see, the thing is, that sounds like a Belfast Kit. That's how we'd <laughs> yeah. say that in Belfast. And since we're starting, welcome to Kit. Uh, so Wilson, is that right? Wilson. Well, let's just call you Kate. Kate. Yeah, you go for the easy words. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> we'll go for Kate. Now, if I was English, I would not say Kate. I would say Kate. But I know. Uh, yeah, so uh, you know, you, you welcome Kate. to Kate. There's no problem by saying Kate. Most of, uh, the, from the UK or the US are saying Kate. Well, let's say Kate. And gets and I mean oh, that's, that's where we get our accent from. We get it from the Vikings and all that, and the Nordics, and that's how we get our English. And that's how English was spoken by Queen Elizabeth the First. Might shock people that Queen Elizabeth the First would have said Kate, whereas Queen Elizabeth the Second would have to eat several prunes and have them Kate, Kate, Kate. No, that would be Charles. Anyway, a uh, bit of a comedy moment. Um, Kate, where did it all start? Walking around one day and uh, got an alien abduction or what? What happened? Explain your background. I know that uh, my friend Colin Wolford uh, has explained that I think he met you at the International UFO Congress or UFO Megacon, was it? Well, I was at the UFO Megacon, yes. But also a, a small, a, another organization called UFO Truth. You were at in England, is that right? No, uh, yeah. Gary has so. I'm not sure. I've, I've been to so many right now, so I don't remember all, all of the names. My god, what a way to be! What a way to be! What a way to be! Yeah. Well, Kate, <laughs> welcome to the basis project, and we're into detail and where the detail goes to the detail. So, um, explain where this whole story starts and who are you? I mean, you, you're obviously a very intelligent, articulate individual and you know what happened well if you are referring to my first close encounter then i was just two years old wow so so yeah it started very early uh it's actually a quite cute funny story because um all of this happened very close out to christmas and um, i remember it so well because my mother she has been taking me to the bedroom for the night and putting me into the crib but I remember that I wasn't tired. So I was standing in the crib and I was looking around in the, this dark room and seeing the, 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 the light coming from the moon and everything into, into the room. And then suddenly it, this, the wall on my left side became a little bit kind of blurry. And this little gray creature came out from that, this wall. He did not walk, but he was more like he was gliding over the floor until he was ending up in front of my crib. And he, he, he was just a little taller than me, not much. Remember that I was three years old and I was standing in a crib and I think that one meter, 20 centimeters or something, perhaps he was something like that. And of course, since I was three years old, I will start blabbering and trying to, who, who are you? And blah, 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 blah. But then I understood very fast that he, he did not communicate with me with talking. So he was doing it through his mind and yeah. So we were communicating in that way instead. I have to say, I have to say a two years old or three years old, is there any evidence of you having any kind of pre-birth or past life experience in this regard? I have a lot of past lives that I remember. Well, let's, let's start with this one. And really, I mean, what kind of family were you born into and what kind of talents do you have? Are you an industrial archaeologist or brain surgeon or... I mean, what talents do you think are there to um, to attract well, them to you in that way? Well, back in those days, uh, the feeling that he gave me was that he was there to see if I was okay. And that was a good feeling. And, and then he just left the same way that he came. And then he took off with another one inside of a craft that was hanging outside the window for a little bit. And took off of oh, the old sort of flying saucer type thing was it a flying saucer type thing or... yeah it was something flying yeah because we were we were on the second floor so this was no car nothing like that at all so uh yeah uh, well 
since I was from a very, very early age, I haven't always been seeing, um, I, I always like to construct and build things. I was uh, just three, four years old when I was getting my first Lego. Normally you're giving that small kids the big Legos, but I was getting this, uh, you know, the first spacecraft that they sent to the moon. I don't remember the name of it. Uh, Saturn that was or the, the lunar module, was it? Or the command uh, the, the module? Long, the Saturn like a rocket. Yeah, the Saturn V. Yeah, that was my first Lego. Wow. <laughs> so you started so I, you started with both feet on the ground then. Yeah, you can say so. But uh, over the years, well, uh, when it comes to the... I have still been doing the building and construction, building houses and the interiors for 30 years. But I can also make a wedding dress and all things like that. So I'm what you can call multi-talented and do almost everything that I can think of. Uh, but when it comes to the things that I'm supposed to do, then it then it is actually uh, cosmology, uh, quantum physics, astrophysics, all of this that I'm working with now. That in this will be my next book. That now you've said next, so obviously you've got several. Well, I have another one. That this is my first one. Uh, this is the, a hybrid story. That's my bio. And uh, that would imply, have you discussed this with um, um, <clears throat> fine lady in, in, in the United States, Barbara Lamb? She published a book on no. her. Yeah, I, I wasn't able to talk with her. I was supposed to do that when I was in Laughlin, now in, in February, but yeah. uh, she got sick. So, oh, I'm uh, sorry yeah. to hear that. I'm sorry to hear that she got sick. She's a big favorite here, came here in Wiltshire. I'm in here in Wiltshire in uh, the this, this center of crop circle country. And she came here many, many times. But, uh, okay, where are you now? I mean, what part of Norway did all this happen? Well, this my first experience was uh, happened, uh, I think it's around, uh, it will be around 15, uh, 20 minutes from Oslo, going west. It's uh, on a place called Drammen. Okay. So I'm familiar uh, with that part of uh, uh, Norway, um, soon and, uh, and Oslo and the airport and things around there. But is 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 that n not far from the airport? The air airport east of Oslo. The, the the airport is the other way. That's the east. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's the it's the opposite direct direction. I mean, is the is the area known for activity, or is it just just where you happen to live? Well, I just happened to live there, but um, later when I was growing up, I was, I heard that this actually runs with the family. So I know that my mother has seen them, my grandfather and some several aunts have also seen them. Well, do, you have, wanna, do you want to go into this history? Let, let's track. go into you and then work back from where who you are and also then the whole family, because I've heard this with several uh, Nordic abductee. So this is, or would you call yourself a, a contactee or abductee or, or, or what? Well, for me, well, I guess that there's a little bit of the language barrier there because for me, I don't see the difference. <laughs> well, I think uh, an abductee is involuntary, a contactee is voluntary. I think that's the basic difference. Okay. Um, well, for me, I think that since I'm thinking, I, for me, I know that we have been living many, many lives. We are internal. And I know that I also have been one of them in a past life. So I guess that's why they have been connecting with me in this life. Now, this is very interesting. I mean, this is very advanced. It's, I, uh, it's, it's, this is extremely interesting because it's much more engaging. So let's let's go into your past lives then. Do you want to discuss that? Yeah, we can talk about that. Which one of them you want to talk about? Well, <laughs> it's, it's like you know a, which one the, started first or last? Do you want to go from reverse order or, or order of importance? It's entirely up to you. Well, um, I remember men, I remember several lives, but uh, the best life that I really remember a lot of and that has also had a big impact in this life is my Mongolian life. That's a little bit far from Norway. Absolutely. Big change. So, uh, yeah, there was a cat there. <laughs> yeah, it's just gone up the stairs. Yeah. Did you see that? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. It's just... No, uh, when I was growing up in this life, I actually had 
so many things that popped up that I felt the urge to do or figure out or yeah, things like that. Um, I was around nine, 10 years old when I had this fascination for uh, Chinese uh, art, for example. Uh, I never read about it. I just wanted to look at it and, and draw them and all of that. Um, and when I was, let me see, around 11, then I started to draw fashion. And I always had this particular jacket with the skin fur around here. But I also had this kind of a belt with a material in front on the back. And I was drawing it and drawing it and drawing it, but they never become right until the day I put them together. And then it was actually the Mongolian suit. Right. And uh, when I was a little bit older than that, then I was having this very incredibly urge that I needed, uh, I was so desperately wanted an eagle or a hawk, but of course the eagle would be the first prize, kind of. Uh, but of course that's not allowed in Norway. So in my desperation, I got myself two pigeons. So you can wonder, you can wonder my mother's face when she was coming up and she heard, heard this from the bedroom. <laughs> and I changed my closet into the, Cage. <laughs> Why were you not allowed? Is it a hawk? No, a uh, hawk. Uh, having hawks or eagles is not allowed in Norway to have that privately. Ah, okay. But they're, I can understand. they understand. Okay, because they they are well. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a lot of things like like, like that, and there was also this very special song that I did. Not the, I did not know the name of the song or what kind of song it was, but it, every time I heard it, I knew it was not Norwegian. Then I was all the way out there in the Mongol, in the steppes, the, the, yeah, in the landscape, big landscapes. So um, there were so many things that I had this very, very special feeling for, but I did not know where they came from. But um, let me see, this, this was many, many years back. This was back in 94, 95 or something. I, w I was out there driving with my boyfriend and I was sitting there next to him and suddenly I was not in the car anymore. I had this vision that I was so into this vision. So I was actually, suddenly I was sitting on the top of a horse and the picture, the thing that I saw was so clear that I was even seeing the different colors in the mane of the horse. I knew exactly how I looked like. I knew how I was dressed. But the feeling that I had, it was overwhelming. I was so happy because I was very, very close to be home to that person that I loved, that I haven't seen for a long, long time because I have been out hunting. And I, I re even remember the landscape around me and that it was stunning. And then the next, next second, I was back in the car again and I was super frustrated and I could not tell him anything. So uh, this, I have never forgotten about it. I mean, so, was he so, receptive in any way to your experiences or did you just voluntarily just not, exp you know, not mention them? No, I did not tell him. I could not tell him. I could not tell him anything like about this, not the close encounters or, or the past lives or anything like that at all. So, but the thing is that when I came home, I drew myself, I drew my own face, how I looked like. And, uh, and uh, so, so I kept that, and I'm glad I actually did because I could show this picture later. When because 2017, I actually went to Mongolia. Can you? So it, was this in the same time period, or was it a recent time or ancient time in in our history, or was it the same world as such as this one? Yeah. Uh, well, when I showed my my guide the picture, she said that I was from around the 19 900. Uh, I'm a little bit mixing up with the BC or th that because that's different kind of time thing from Norway. <laughs> what you are what you are saying? I think it's 900 before Christ or anything like that. It, it was very very yeah. old. Yeah. And here, here's so that's the that's three thousand years ago. Okay. Yeah. So that's the picture. Wow. So um, from that picture, she could actually tell tell me from what kind of area of, of, uh, of the Mongolia I was actually living and what time period. So that was actually fascinating. And uh, I also had a long discussion uh, with, with her and she could tell me that the things that I was talking about, her grandmother was trying to tell her about these things like that. When we were driving in the car out in the desert, in Mongolian desert, I told her, you know what, I have this name in my head that for big sky that has to be Tengir or Tengiri. And she looks at me and yeah, yeah that's true. 
So I was getting the one, the confirmation after another all the time. So this is multi, so was, this is intergenerational contact. Yeah. So it's basically a way of living. That's just the way that you were living it in between these areas. Yeah. So that old life actually still affects me today. But it's, I mean, um, is there any reason, anything that you can think of which, which allows you to, um, which allows you to actually experience these memories? Because there are some who've had uh, experiences where they didn't go through a process before birth, which allowed them to retain memories. Or is there any, anything that's at all that you can recall during these different lives, between these different lives? Well, I don't know much. Um, I don't know what is happening exactly between our lives. Uh, I know more about the process that is going on between our lives with the consciousness and all of that. And I'm describing that in my next book. But um, Well, go with whatever you know and understand. This is about your story and your perceptions. So let's hear it all. Well, how things are going on is that that's a too big topic actually to start talking about because now right now there are actually several other topic topics that you need to understand first before you are even going there. So I guess we have to skip okay, that. Okay, let's let's uh, not skip anything. Let's find out how you want to tell your 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 account so people understand it in the way that that you wish to tell it. It's entirely up to you. Yeah. No, so so if I'm going back to the Mongolian thing again, um, for me, I, I think it's incredible how much uh, past lives actually are uh, coloring us for every life that we are having. Uh, but most people, they, they, they don't even know. You can have a phobia for things and you have no idea why you even have the phobia. Or you can have a lot of things that you love so much, but why do you love it? Why do you have special... Um, desires or let's say that you love a language you have a very easy to speak that and that language you recognize yourself in the places you have never been before of course that everything of all of this is coming from past lives now you say of course so why is it i mean you've got you've got an extremely ability you've got a tremendous ability to think clearly and lucidly about these things and it doesn't uh, whereas m a lot of people or most people i would suggest would be afraid or they just don't remember or or whatever why is it why do you think of what makes you special to be able to do this or have you been given a special gift for a particular reason and again let's get into these past lives and the other things you want to tell and, and understand well why i am different in that way i i don't know i can't actually tell um i think that perhaps it's um being I think that you, you actually have to be very self-conscious, uh, of course, skeptic, but also very analytic about how you're thinking about everything that you are, are experiencing. Yes, exactly. Um, but yeah. also that you can put everything that you are, are experiencing into a bigger context. Yes, it's, it's relative perspective of where you're perceiving and looking at things. Yeah. Okay, so we've got these past lives. Um We've had the, the one about Mongolia. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, you've got the one here. But what about the other ones? What's what's actually some, what, what are these bringing them together? And how do you wish to bring this together so you can, I mean, we've got as long as you want to say this. So, so let, let's, let's hear it. Well, when it comes to my other lives, I guess that they are much more violent. Um, yeah, violent. Uh, in past lives, you have been the the victorious, but you have also been the victim. So I think that even to remember that, it also makes you look at life in a different perspective. Because um, I think that we shall um, not judge, for example, when we are seeing other people. Okay. We are we are we are supposed to yeah love the contrast as, as you're calling it let's say that th this life you have to have all the bad things uh, to make the contrast because if you don't have the contrast you will not learn so it's like you if you're never experiencing bad stuff you will never experience experiencing happiness and, and to experience happiness in the context of happiness you've got to experience unhappiness 
I mean, it, it yeah. looks as if you've been given a full range of things to experience so you can get a wider understanding from a different perspective of what's yes. actually happening. Yeah, and when you are get the, the more and more you are actually getting um, aware of this, and when you know that every one of us we are functioning like a radio antenna. <coughs> um, so what we are, I guess a lot of people have heard about the law of attraction, and it's very you can actually prove a lot of this law of attraction into the physics world that what we are sending out you are getting back. But most of the time, when we are, are experiencing things that are happening around us, then we are taking it so into ourselves and we are just focusing on the things that, for example, are wronged to us instead of thinking that, okay, well, I see the contrast. I don't want that, but that makes me know what I do want in the opposite direction and then start focusing on that instead. Because when we do the, the things that we are focusing on, that is what will be happening, that what will yeah, we are like creators. Well, exactly. We we create, we manifest. So can you yeah. can you describe in any more detail your your past lives, and then uh, sort of give a more description to what those experiences were, if the, if it's if it's not painful yeah. for you to do so? No, no, it's not. Um, well, I can tell a little bit more from the Mongolian one. Um, well, when I was there with, with this guide, we were also into this kind of theater. And um, suddenly there was these two women there singing. And of course, they were singing this song that I really love. And it's called Long Song, Mongol Mongolian Long Song. And I told my guide that how I felt every time I heard this kind of song. And she said, well, that is what it means. You are out there in the big fields when you are. That's what the songs are all about. Um, uh, but the most funny thing for me and the best compliment ever, I got on a horse ride. Because in, in the old days here in Norway, um, 10 years back, I had four horses. And I also have been riding a lot for other people too. And they have always been complaining about my style of riding. Because I'm not sitting like this. I'm click, 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 click when you're riding. Or uh, even if, if you're doing the Western kind of riding, it was not right either. Then, so they were always complaining so you, on me. You so. were you were almost a bit bit like a west, like a guy in the west and wild west, west or something. You just sort of. No, no, I no, I wasn't at all. I did not do the western riding either. They were complaining there too. So uh, when I come there uh, up to the Costco Lake, and there were horses there, and I said, "Well, we of course we have to go out horse riding." And um, the first thing that happened was that this horseman he looked at me, and of course, tourist. That's his idea when he saw me. So he was, um, what are you calling it? Those things that you're putting your feet into? Stirrups? When um, when, yeah, when, when you're sitting in a saddle. You have yeah, you have, a st you have the, um, uh, it's not the, it's the, I think, I, no, not stirrups. Anyway, the things you put your feet into. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But the thing is that he was putting them in, in the length that the way that the tourists are sitting. And I knew it when I saw him do it. And I thought, nope, you're not going to do that. You are going to put them in the length of the Mongolian way. And he was just looking at me. Huh? <laughs> I guess he haven't had that question before. <laughs> but, so, but he, but knew, he knew what you were talking about, though. Yeah, he did. But he was very surprised. I guess I was the first tourist that told him that, no, 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 not the tourist way, the Mongolian way. Well, so, it's, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, if I, if I was to see a, a Norwegian, uh, obviously a blonde uh, girl, you know, obviously a tourist, you know, I'll immediately just mean, ah, you want to do things a Mongolian way. I mean, that's the first thing I would think of, obviously, but obviously he didn't. Yeah, well, he did that, did that at first, but uh, so um, then we start riding, and I was thinking that to myself, that, okay, it was now or never. Just let them old inner, inner modern golden just get free flow and just, yeah. So I had a good time on the horseback and then I suddenly see the face of my guide and the horseman and the, some others there. They were looking at my direction and they were smiling and talking and I was like, okay, what is so funny? So I was riding up to them and my guide tells me that, that this horseman, he was looking at me and he said, well, that woman, she really knows how to do a horse. 
So that was the best compliment ever. So, so um, finally, someone no, recognized my kind no of No argument finding. there then. So this is wonderful, but this means you've got that memory. You've got that memory of that life immediately for recall. That's a wonderful thing to be able to have. And, and what about the other lives? Or anything more from, uh, from Mongolia? Um, well, uh, right now it just um, popped out of my head, but... Um, it, it was just an incredible feeling to be home, be back. But of course, I was very, very sad also when we came out there in the desert because um, the person that I was supposed to go home to in that vision that I had, that person was not there anymore. I was several thousand years too late. So yeah. that, that was very... But you had that, that ability to record, to remember it though. Was it something you could really feel and... and... An experience. Yeah, but it was very, very strong feeling, very, very strong. Absolutely. How do you feel that that was happening? I mean, do you think you were actually re-accessing that real life at the time? It wasn't a memory. You were actually joining with that other person who was you in that other world. No. No, I think it. it for me, it's just it's just a memory because everything that we are thinking is out there. Explain. It, it, Explain it, that concept. Um, if it's you like, wish. It's like the, yeah, it's, it's like the consciousness. Everything that we are thinking will are staying out there in the matrix. And that's why how we are, since if since it's not just one of us, but since there are so many of us, and all of us are have being an, 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 an antenna, and everyone is thinking and sending out things, wishes or bad things or good things or whatever, we are creating all kinds of stuff and Everything that we are thinking is out there. Well, that, that's or, very. Say, that's ex out, 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 out there is wrong too because we are inside of the everything. Because uh, let let me put it that uh, in another way. Um, a lot of time I hear science people saying that um, there's if you're going down to the atoms and the electrons, there's such a much a lot of empty space in there. And I said, you know what? it does not exist empty space because let's say if you take all that space that they are saying that are empty and you're putting the consciousness in there all the information that are in the consciousness then you can see that we are like walking talking holograms that are going through all of this kind of information all the time we are walking talking information now this is very important uh, I, I've, just for the record we are we are recording this in the climate of the lockdown uh, due to the so-called coronavirus. And one of the key things that's happening right now is we're all being made very afraid and imprisoned and confined. Do you do you have any views on that just while we're in this m modality of fear and everybody in a entire planet practically is locked down and confined? Do you think there's something yeah. else involved there? Well, for me, I all the time have been just thinking about this... Uh, Laboratory, uh, laboratory, and some, perhaps an unfaithful servant that has been trying to sell stuff or or whatever. For me, I'm not going into that kind of discussion that much. Uh, um, the, the the virus is out there, and hopefully, and it will not happen again. But in the future, I know it will be happening again because our consciousness, again, we are sending out, we are focusing on so much of this stuff that we don't want. So we are now actually creating more of it in the in the long run. Well, that's the point. Do you think our consciousness is being manipulated to create this? Somebody is making us make our own this event. No. No, we are we are our, our own creators. We don't need others to trying to get in and trying to do, to yeah mani manipulate. Well, that's us. the point. No. We've got others who are maybe manipulating us, making me us think that there's nobody else there. I, I call it the the thirteenth terminal in a twelve terminal network. The twelve computers don't realize it's a thirteenth and giving them rogue data. Um, that's my personal perspective, but I don't want to have too much more discussion on this, but, I mean, do you think that this our consciousness can be manipulated against us so we actually damage ourselves in this regard? Well, um, in, in a deeper level, we cannot be taken over or run by others, but we can be manipulated by the normal daily uh in news or things like that and of course uh it will be 
let's say that the consciousness, if you have a, if you're having a little town, let's say there are 500 people there, and it started with a little group and it grows and grows and grows, and 500 people there have this same thought, let's say about the coronavirus, it will become a very very strong field, and if someone else is coming in there, it's very difficult for that one person alone to actually not be affected mind mindsetly by those that big field exactly so, so, of course, so you, you can have that too so that's why you can also say that uh when uh, i guess a lot, most people have heard about when they are doing these huge um uh, meditations yes um, and i'm very yeah. very concerned about that because i think that's not something we want to have happening but tell us more well, a lot of times when they are doing these very big uh, meditations, um, they can actually measure that that field around the world uh, or on yeah. the entire globe. I've seen uh, yeah, Harvard U University, I think, has done work on this. There is a measurable effect. Yeah, but but the thing is, when you say that you don't like it, um, for me, I think that well. A big meditation like that is good if you are doing it in the right way. Because if you are doing a meditation and you are focusing on the bad stuff, then you're just making this big feel and you are creating more of it. Exactly. You could yeah. not have described have it any better than that. You have to focus on what you want and not what you do not want. So that's where the contrast is coming in. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So where do, where do you feel uh, just concentrating on your past lives and things? Do you want to describe more of that and and bring it bring it through? Well, I I, I think that we if if you take your, taking a deeper look at ourselves, as I said, that what are you afraid of? What do you long for? What do you like? What do you love? All kind of things like that. Um, the, yeah, then you can find out more about who you actually are because the life you are having now, you are the sum of previous lives. So a lot, most people are just thinking that okay, we'll be we born and then we'll, we will die, and everything that are happening to us, that's this life. This is all who we are, but it's not. So that's the big change if well, you can look at yeah. yourself in a much much bigger perspective than just this tiny little bit. Because if you just look at this little piece that this life are, then there will be a lot of things that will know that will not give any kind of meaning. Well, I think this is the problem. I mean, we've had a, a lot of coercive thought, uh, um, thought or collective um, mind viruses or religions or belief systems imposed on us for the last 1800 years, no, you know, two, well, a long time. And that's what's yeah. being imposed now. And But how do you think that we could break free of this we, uh, of, well, as such? Well, the, the first thing you have to do is to stop following the mainstream. Not believe that ev what everyone el else is telling you even if it's the news or conspiracy stuff or what, whatever it is, uh, most people are just hearing some rumor or hearing something or reading something, and then they are thinking, okay, that's true. Instead of actually feeling inward and inside themselves, because if they start listening to themselves, they will actually, after a little while, because it, everything takes practice, then you will, your body or your inner feeling will tell you, this is right, this is wrong. Now, how it's how how does that start? What feelings should people go for, which will get them to get further into what you've just said, as opposed to being fed this diet of mainstream television, which is or mainstream media has. And I mean, one of the people who did some research, I interviewed a young woman a, a, a few a couple of weeks ago, and she looked up what the word media means. It's all about spells and lies, and that's what you that's what we're getting. Yeah, I think I think that we if the, if we want to do really to change this world, a brilliant thing to do that, it would be like let's say that when you are seeing the big pressure that they have been having in the news all around the world on just the coronavirus alone, imagine how it would change the world if you were doing the same pressure in the news but just on the positive things. 
Absolutely. But there is a seems to be a disbelief that this virus is actually there. Maybe what they're trying to get us to generate isn't actually manifesting. Something's blocking it. And what do you feel about that? Well, um, I have known several people that ha has it. And of course, for me, I think that, well, I have been putting out questions mark there too, because I know that the flu is killing much more people during the year than this one has. But in the same time, um, it's killing in a different way. When you are having the flu, well, you're not seeing mass graves and uh, people lying to like this in line in the respirators and things like that. So, of course, I will prefer to have the flu and, of course, stay away from that one. Even if I'm, I'm not sure if I actually did get the COVID virus. Because I was out flying in the U.S. and I had several airports and hotels and lots of people around me all the time. So I was very sick over there and I was really sick when I was getting home and I'm still sick. How how did that sickness manifest itself? Because I think there's a there's a good few people are coming up with what you've just said insofar as that they've had something already uh, around about the time that you're talking about, yet it was not before we were told it was this virus. We just had a sickness and that was it. Yeah, no. I, I, when I was flying from from uh, Heathrow to the US uh, to LA, my my next, the person next to me, she was a lovely woman from Northern Italy. And? And, and most people know how bad it is in Northern Italy. And how bad is it? How bad was she? And do you, did you get it from her or did you have it already? Or was it something else no, you had? No, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, but it has been different from a normal flu. I mean, this is the so, trouble. Uh, I mean, if if you if you walked into hospital and you just lost a leg and a head or something, and you dropped down dead because you 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 know because you lost a leg and a head, it would be attributed to COVID virus. This is the problem. We're having all this phrase, uh, you know, related related causes, but not the actual dis disease itself, or do you call it the virus itself? There seems to be a problem here. For for me, I I don't know. As I said, if I have it had it or not but uh it has been different from any other kind of flu i had because uh well it started when i was uh, i wasn't sick when i was together with this woman on the plane and i also felt okay when i was in in la for a week and but when i came to laughlin i started to be, become very sick and um after that explain I exactly where, what were your symptoms what were your experiences about this this is getting down to it now well, it started with a sore throat and um, headache and the typical normal flu kind of symptoms and a lot of fever. Uh, luckily for me, I, I did not get the chest kind of problem. But uh, the thing is, uh, and later on, it felt like someone has beaten you, beaten you up like with a baseball tree. And you a baseball also bat, yeah. So uh, luckily for me, I was able to is this stay head, a bit Is this more. headaches and did you have any, any lack of vision or blurring or any other? Did you lose any of your primary faculties in any way? No. But uh, I, pre I prefer trying to sleep as mo most as possible when it, when it affected my head. But uh, still, I am still now, it's week 11. I mean now... And I'm still have the ear infection and the fever, and uh, yeah, I'm still I'm still not okay. So this is, has been a long ride. Yeah, well, you look fine, uh, but you don't. It doesn't really manifest itself overtly. So I mean, you wouldn't know that you had anything, really. No, I'm not sure because it comes and goes and comes and goes. So and this, it, it's the sore throat and the fever and this here that comes and goes, comes and goes has been doing that for now 11 weeks. Well, and antibiotics, penicillin, not work. It's well, not it, working. It, it doesn't work with it, with it with the virus anyway. But have you been given any anything else, this this solution that, that Trump has mentioned, uh, this hydrofluorine or cl chlorine? Or chlor or no. Chlor no. You, have you managed to get anything like that? Are you taking anything for it? No. I haven't. But uh, when, when that said, um, th when I get back from, from the U.S., I have been living more or less in a quarantine situation anyway. So that's why I haven't bothered the health system. 
I mean, are you basically living living in an apartment or whatever by yourself, or what? How no, do, how I, I what would you call isolation? House. I have my own big house here, so I'm staying here, and I also, but I also have my old mother to take care of, and she has serious uh, heart condition and problems like that, and I know that she would not never survive a flu or a coronavirus or anything like that. So I have been very extra precautions around her or anyone else. And have you had any ET related experiences as a result of this? And anybody, any of these other beings, you know, you mentioned earlier on that you know the, the Grey had come to check you out for health, just check that you were okay, or uh, in words to that effect. Have you had anything at all like that happen to you since this problem has occurred? No, not not that I know of. No, but I had this very actually very. Um, funny weird experience that was actually in bulgaria two years back i was in a conference down there and um, the week before i was going to the conference i actually took a little dive down the stairs so i took my ankle so <laughs> i was jumping around in the conference and in bulgaria on crutches um and one of the other speakers down there he said why don't you ask your helpers for help I said, well, I did. I was very good at doing that before, but in some place or another, I just forgot to ask. So, okay, well, I can go upstairs to my hotel room and I lay down on the bed and I asked for help. And I'm not sure how long it took. It didn't take any long at all. And then suddenly it was like someone touched my knees and dragged their hands like this down to my feet. And it was so physical that I just, I, I was, wow. What is going on? I looked down on my feet and there was no one standing there. And this happened two, three times and I was, ooh, oh, holy crap. And later on, I was told that they were actually, someone said that they had been seeing a crap over the hotel that evening. So is that a coincidence? I don't know, but I did not see them. I just felt. And did that improve? Did that actually help you with your, with your ankle? It did. Wonderful. So, do you yeah. think do you think we could all sort of ask for our helpers to come down and, and help us in this situation? Do you think this something could happen on a global event level? Well, I mean, it's a bit like uh, you know, we've got a global coronavirus pandemic. Who do you call, who do you phone? <laughs> Hello. Well, I guess. I Intergalactic in coronavirus that, survivor helpline. Yeah, I think that in most cases, actually, we have to deal with it ourselves. Um, we do have most of the technology and everything that we need to help ourselves. But um, as a community, we are not using it because the big money machines, they, they don't want to let us do it. Now, I've never I'm heard not this not happen not before. Not Excuse not me, funny. I've just got to stop you there. I've never heard of that kind of uh, uh, allegation before. So I would need to be very stern about this, he said, in a sarcastic accent, um, that I'm shocked that somebody would, would say a thing like that. Boo-hoo to that. So what is yeah. what do you think is actually going on here? Well, no, as I said, I think that, um, as I write in my first book, that there's no rescue from above. Uh, a lot of people are thinking that, okay, they can offer us a lot of new technology to save our world, uh, our health or environment or all kinds of things. But as I say also that we have so much of this kind of technology or technology that works, that will work to help us as a humanity and globally already and there are so many people that are trying to get free electricity you can just just take a look at tesla he's a exactly. good example yes and that was all suppressed we've got some guys here in uh, we've got some guys here in cornwall to create what's called a cold steam engine tesla's cold steam turbine and engine in the united kingdom uh, there's about three legal and only ways you can be cu cured of cancer if you try to do it any other way, like uh, GK, G, G, GK math or GC math, uh, and you try to do that, they're going to throw you in a French prison. It's not not hopeful. How do you think we could break free of that? Um, well, now I, I now I don't 
know the system, how it works in the UK, but I think that um, well, the we, only thing... There's a thing called a that, European arrest warrant, and that's been used to suppress any use of this uh, drug to actually cure people so that the big pharma yeah. chemical people can make a lot of money while people die. Yeah. Um, how to explain that in an easy way. Um, I think that we, we have to actually take back our mind power, our own will, but to do that, then we must be conscious, our own mind, our own, we have to be conscious ourselves inside ourselves. Uh, because when we are conscious ourselves, we cannot be manipulated with the things that are around us, and then we then we get our power back. Um, when it comes to the cancer, I have a very good friend of mine. Um, 27 years ago, she was told by the doctor that you have a few months left to live. And she said, well, I refuse chemo. I refuse all the kind of treatment that you have. I will do it my way. That is 27 years ago. She has been working with herself, her own consciousness, learning to the, the, the food, uh, what her body tells her, what the food she shall, shall eat. She, she's doing this kind of thing with every as aspect of her life. And she's still here. But now, lately, she has been having a lot of struggle with the, uh, the power companies. And they want to put in the smart meter, all of that crap there. And she refused to do it because she don't want to have the radiation around her. And especially also because of the cancer. And all of, because of all of the stress, now her cancer has touched to grow again. Right. And... Yeah, and she has been, now she is really, really in a bad state. She has been there sometimes before, so but crossing her fingers that she will do it this time too. And she was now staying in a hospital waiting for the answer for the other hospital if they are actually able to do some kind of operation on her stomach. They, they can't remove it because then she will bleed to death. Now this but is a, the, I've heard this is another story I've heard in in with people with a stomach problem at some kind of issue involving that part of the body. I mean, it just seems to be four or five or six people now are having this yeah. issue. Um, yeah, and, and 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 the thing is that when she was in the hospital, all the food that the hospital are serving, that is actually food that are that cancer actually loves. High sugar, high carbohydrate, that kind of stuff. Yeah, overcooked vegetables, sugar, white flour, and all these kind of things that she was not supposed to eat. They had nothing of the food that she needed to eat. So at the end now, she said, you know what? I can't stay here because you, as a hospital, you will actually kill me. So she has now back in her home and she is making her juices, making her smoothies. But she is following everything that she has learn herself and what, what is that what sort of recipes are we talking about here what kind of food for people well she's trying to uh, go organic as much as possible ever uh, she is eating all kind of nuts all kind of vegetables fruit uh, and yeah that's the raw more kind of raw food kind of thing not processed food of course you can have a little bit snack now here and then but most of the time she's very conscious about the food that she's eating and but not it's not only the food it's also her mindset yeah if she's the mindset your mindset, attitude your yeah it will grow so she is working on trying to see herself as a healthy fresh person that's her main, that's what she's focusing on the best as she can. That's why she is still here after 27 years. And hopefully there will be at least 20 more years. Yeah, we can do the UFO stuff. Um, well, if I go back to when I was two years old, because as I said, it was a kind of funny story. Um, it was actually, well, after this creature, as I said, was leaving my house. Now my, you my called room. it a creature. You again, you called it a creature. You didn't call it an alien. Is there a reason for that? No. The thing is that when that creature was leaving my room, so in my head I was thinking, "Yay, Santa Claus was here," because my mother was, has told me had told me that Santa Claus would be coming soon. So in my head that was Santa Claus. So one week later, when the Christmas Eve was coming, she was carrying me into the living room. <coughs> on her arm because I was going to meet Santa 
Um, but in the, in the living room, there was this guy with a red suit, false beard, and a plastic face. And I was terrified, and I was screaming, and I was angry because that was not my Santa Claus. I think you're damn right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so it was a little bit. It's a little bit hilarious. I was terrified for that one, but not the first one. But I mean, did you meet Santa Clauses again? <laughs> well, not in that. Not that time. No, I was around ten years old when I had my next experience. Uh, for, when I was around 10 years old, it was actually a very, quite sad time. Um, I was a, much of a loner because I did not fit in. I always tried my best to fit in, but I never knew why I didn't. Because yeah. I was thinking that, well, I, I look like everyone else, but yeah. still I did not fit in. So uh, very often after my mother went to bed at night, I was crawling out on the roof and I was sitting there looking at the stars and the moon and just thinking that, well, my home is out there someplace and someone out there, come down and pick me up. Take me with you. So I you don't had belong a very, here. You had a very definite conscious feeling of not being from around here. Yeah. And you wanted to go so, home. I wanted to go home, yes. And so, the home uh, wasn't uh, here. Absolutely not. So how did this you reconcile so that? Because, I mean, you're, you're clearly a very well-balanced individual. You, or, or maybe you do, do you sort of go to a small part of the house and sort of hide your head in a in a pillow and just cry all night or what? No, I, no, I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. Well, back in those days, I was, uh, well, when I was 10 years old, I was living and breeding horses and drawing horses all, all the time. And um, when I, one night when I was crawling up to this roof, the thing I remember was this bright light over my head. And the next thing I remember is that I'm lying in my bed next morning. But the difference is that I stopped drawing horses. Then I started drawing the faces of the men without, without any kind of hair, big black eyes and small mouth and things like that. I started talking about other, uh, uh, not dimensions, but other, other planetary systems and things like that. So when I really was getting you get making the other pieces, yeah. Can you get into detail about those other star systems? Can you get into details of all those things and extract, explain them? Well, um, now you're asking a big topic again. Um, for me, I don't remember exactly all the things that I was saying back th back in those days. And these days, when I'm writing this book, I'm not that interested in our local neighborhood, what things that are around here. I'm more talking about how everything works and how it sticks together. But back in those days, I was talking about other planetary systems and um, life forms and things like that. So when I really was getting, uh, making them a big excuse to bully me, they actually stopped. So I think that perhaps they were thinking that. Who's they? They, they were the other kids in school or the people that were living around the area. Is that peer pressure or was there a conscious um, decision or effect to actually do that to you, to, to cause problems for you? Well, um, I am, I'm almost uh, using the term gang stalking. Like, was there some kind of collective definite thing? Yeah, they, they, they were gangs. They were absolutely gangs. They could be up to 12, 15 kids standing outside the house and screaming or yelling all kind of bad stuff such as so, yeah well you're stupid ugly weird all kind of things and that's a big deal for growing up kids yeah it is but did, in the same time that learned me a lot i mean did this you were able to get through this obviously what what, what, yeah, what got you through this well, I think that when you are experiencing things that are um, different from most other people, you can do two things. You can bury it, everything with yourself, or you can start talking about it. And of course, in the beginning, when I, when I did start talking about it and I met people that were skeptics, then I, um, then I tried my best to explain in all kinds of ways to make them understand all of this. 
Now I don't bother to do that anymore. Even when I, when I do my lectures all around the world, I said, you know what? I know there are skeptics there, but you know what? I don't care. I'm here to tell my story. That's final. I don't, I don't uh, believe I know. And that's a big difference. Well, tell your story is so important. Telling your story is so important. So let, let's really get into it. Let's let you tell. Let's Katie here. Let's Kate. It's Kate, you know, Kate. <laughs> Kate, <laughs> Kate. Okay, Kate, let's, yeah. let, let's get on with you telling your story here then. Like, I'd prefer that a lot more than just what you've been saying because I want to hear all your story about how Kate became Kate. <laughs> My God. No, almost Irish. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, I think that my uh, the strongest kind of close encounters that I had was actually in Hul Mountain. I was supposed to stay there. Uh, this is back in 1998, 97. I'm messing up the, the years sometimes. Um, I was supposed to stay there for two months working on my book. I stayed there for one week. There were, I had no car and almost no Tele telephone connections either, so and, and battery connections, so it, it, it was bad. But um, I really loved it to stay up there. It was so alone. It was so quiet that, can, that you can hear the quietness. Absolutely beautiful. And what do you mean by hear you know, the quietness? When, it, when, it is, when the room or the place are so quiet that you can hear the quietness, you, you, you just have to experience it. You can't is describe it, it. Is it. There's a difference between quiet and silent. Was there some yes. other thing there that you that you were experiencing other than the the, the silent? I'm not sure what you mean, but it was very very silent. It's just beautiful. But uh, the I'm thing is, that I'm I, referring I, I, I'm referring to a thing called the the silence, where it is too quiet. You're missing other thoughts, other other input. There's a difference. I was just wondering if it was actually you were in that area, you were maybe somewhere else. Well, it it wasn't it wasn't in my mind. It was the sur surroundings that was that was quiet. Sometimes, if you are been very stressed or working too much or anything like that, and sometimes it will it feel like a uh, the best peace in the world to get some place where it's so quiet. There's no cars, no planes, no TV, nothing, and even the nature. Because of the winter, it was quiet. It was just wonderful. Uh, well, I, I was there for a week. And then I'm waking up in the morning. And my first thought it was that, well, am I going to be sick or something? Because I felt that my nose was sore. But then I'm looking myself in the mirror. And I'm seeing this gray greenish kind of dry liquid from my nose and from my eyes. But that wasn't the thing that I was looking most at. The, the thing that I was reacting to was this, that... This was not a pillow mark. This was like a sh sharp, solid mark after something that was like a grip that was on my eyelid, upper eyelid, that was stuck here. So I was really wondering, what the hell is this? Um, but it's, of course, it's like these things that, that they use to keep keep the eye open so you can't blink. No, it was actually a helmet thing. I found out that later. Um, the thing is that. When you are staying alone in a the cabin, then you have to you have to make the heat, you have to cook, you have to do all kinds of things. And so, of course, all of these things went back. You didn't think that much about it. But when the night came back again, it was dark. And I changed. My personality changed. I was like a stressed animal in a cage. I, my whole body told me that something had happened, but I could not remember what it was. So I did not want to go to sleep. So I think I was reading the same magazine 20 times the next night. I refused to sleep. And uh, then I was lucky that I was getting in contact with those people that owned this cabin. So next day they said, that, well, we will come up then and we will get you back down in the, into the city. And um, when I came back to the city, then I could see how much I have changed because in the cabin, there was no electricity at all. So when you are getting back to the society and these days, what will be the first thing you are doing? Of course, you will charge your phone. So when I was putting my charger into the wall, then it sounded like the microphone when the microphone is screaming. Everyone knows how that bad that sounds. So 
clicking in and out, and it was the same bad, ugh, terrible sound. And I could hear the light bulbs. The, it was, and when they were talking, the sound was too loud. It, it was terrible. So I changed a lot. And my boyfriend, he came and picked me up, driving me back to where we were living. And back in those days, he had bought, bought this kind of perfume to me that I used to please him, not to please myself, because I lost my sense of smell when I was 10 years old, when I had my second encounter. But now I suddenly get my smell back. So I remember I took the perfume on, went out to his office, just to turn around and get inside again to just wash it off because it was just too much. So, uh, yeah, I was still, for many, many months, I was still wearing, putting stuff into my ears to get the sound of people down to the normal level. And uh, even, even now, back in 2007, 2016, when I was coming to the UK and I was staying over there with, with friends, the first thing, thing I was asking about, do you have a clock in the bedroom? And they said, no, don't you worry because it's an electrical, electrical clock. I said, nah, it's not good. So we had to turn it all off. But still then I could hear the power that's inside the wall. We had to turn off the power on the wall to actually make it quiet. Amazing. <laughs> so yeah, I, ha I, have a, I have a very good hearing. And you have that to this day? Yeah. So, so, so I, but, but the continue thing, with what sort of experiences you've had and what sort of enhancements. Did you think those were enhancements or, or do you think that was just a natural, uh, a natural thing that happened when you were in such isolation and quietness? And you have, have you heard that before or since? No. The, the, the thing is that afterwards when I came back home, um, my boyfriend that time, he was the leader of the UFO Norway. And he could see the big changes in me. So uh, through UFO Norway, we contacted a guy that a hypnotist in Oslo that they were normally using in cases like that. So we, we went in there and uh, during the hypnosis, it came, then, then I could recognize that what, what happened. So what happened was that I was in the cabin, I was going to the bed for the night and then suddenly there was this bright light in my bedroom and there was not this smaller grace it was one of the taller grace but he was shining it was like he was glowing big time and i was following him into the living room and there i was i was like i was floating in the air and I had the three of the smaller grace around me and then they were putting this kind of a helmet on my head so there was this grip coming from so, uh, and I guess that they had this solid grip because they wanted this helmet to be really still because during this, uh, uh, that I was remembering, um, I remember this looks like this, like arms on the helmet that was coming in front of my face with like a fork kind of things that was supposed to go up in through my nose until the day, today, and even from a very young age, I hate someone touching my nose. Ugh. I, I, I can look at a heart surgery, eat pizza, but don't ask me to look at a surgery on the nose. I can't deal with it. <laughs> and even they were also having these needles that were supposed to go into my ears. So the whole scenario, it looks like a bad horror movie from the 70s. But still, I know well, that they were That's getting bad in the 70s. That's dreadful. Yeah. Uh, but I still know that they did not do this to harm me in any way. They did this to help me in some other kind of way. So, um, and the funny thing is that from this story here, a few years later, um, a friend of mine, Sid Goldberg from, from uh, US, he was working with a lot of different cases with uh, implants. And he asked me, why don't you buy one of those small magnets and try to stick it? I had this triangle shaped thing yeah. on my neck. Okay. So he said, why don't you buy one of those and stick it on there to see if it, if it will stick? And of course, over the years, I have been joking a lot. Perhaps I have implants, perhaps I don't. But So, well, this time I bought the magnets and, um, of course... Were these, frig, were my, these fridge magnets or the, the, or the molybdenum ones? You know, the silver? The neodym, neodym, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have this. I'm glad I can say it just as well as she can. Okay. So, Kitty. well, I bought, bought them. Yeah, <laughs> I bought them. So, 
of course, going from joking about it till it actually, you're putting it in a mom and it actually sticks is a big wow. Yeah, I have to say uh, that we we had a case in the basis project guy called Matt Todd, and he had a number, uh, I think about five uh, things were shot into him, but he raided a base uh, and got a lot of people out. And uh, he can actually stick these magnets just below the stomach area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. No, so, uh, and, and a friend of mine, he said that, you know what, since your nose has been closed for all these years, why don't you try to stick it on your nose too to see if it sticks? And it was sticking there too. <laughs> so you uh, had, you, okay. so you had a magnet on your nose, as you, no? Well, well, now I have some makeup on, but so the good, the thing is that if you're going to test this on yourself, you should, you should try to make your body temperature as neutral as possible no makeup, no sweaty, nothing like that. And then you must be very careful when you're taking them over because if they are just a half centimeter off, they will fall off. But here, if I put it there, here, then you'll see how you can do this and it will not fall off. I mean, have you, had, I have you had any uh, radio frequency scans or x-rays or MRI scans, which would, which I would have, indicate that? Who did you talk to in the States about this? What? Who I talked to with? In the United States about this, in terms of uh, uh, implant detection. Uh, Sid Goldberg. Right. Yeah. So as you can see, now it, it will not fall off either here. <coughs> but if I take, let's say I take it here, you see it will fall off. It will not stick. So after yep. a little research part, we found out that I have two here, 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 five in the front, all the way down my spine, every side here, and later on I also have several in the front here. So I have more than 30 places. So they have been busy. So um, how, how were these detected? Were they detected using radio frequency meters? I mean, I, I followed uh, Steve, I think it's Steve Kohlberg. Kohlberg. Uh, no, we no. Sid. Sid, okay. Yeah. Lar large no, guy you, with glasses. You, you, were looking, you were using this one very slowly all over the body. Okay. Yeah. So um. And, and do you transmit any frequencies, any any uh, magnetic or electric or uh, electromagnetic signals of any kind? Do they sort of come out of you in various places? I don't know. I haven't tried that one yet. I, ha I haven't tried that kind of ex um, examining yet. Uh, do you, so I, do I you, uh, did you, do you, did you know, or were you able to talk to a, a Dr. Lear in, 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 in the United States who did alien implant uh, extraction? No. Gruesome. No. No. Uh, he's he passed dead. on. He, yeah, he passed on some time ago. Yeah. Yeah, he did. So, no, no I haven't no, been able to talk with him. So. No, in, but, in but Norway, I, in Norway, um, when did things change that you can actually come out? And actually talk about this because it's meant to be quite, uh, uh, um, you know, it's it's not until quite recently I understand what happened that allowed you to even speak about this, write a book, and be seen in daylight talking about things like this. Well, I actually, I, I actually had my first talk about this back in eighty, nine ninety eight. In no, in, in Norway? Oh, in the UK. No. Okay. In the UK, in the but Bufora did, conference. Ah, Bufora. Yeah, I used to be a member of that. I used to be a regional investigations coordinator for Northern Ireland in that. But now I'm, yeah, yeah that's sort of faded by the way. Uh, but in Bufora, so uh, uh, in, in when, 1998? Yeah, that was my first uh, conference abroad. But how did they know about it? There was your book well, out I, by then? I, I, I was going over there also with Odd Gunnar Röd from the UFO Norway. So uh, I was also called in as a speaker. So uh, yeah, also together with Daryl Sims. <coughs> so yeah, but I I also had did had several talks here in Norway before that happened. But uh, now when I but in 2000, uh, 2000 and then then I got my son. So then I kept it quiet down here in Norway, because for for me I had no problem to deal with this stuff. But I did not want him to be bullied in school because of this because of from people that don't understand these things. So, but now he has moved out from the house. So then I can 
do it again. But of course, I have been I have been living more quietly here in Norway. Uh, so I guess people they know me more in the UK and the US than they do, than they do here. When could you actually appear in Norway, talking about this kind of stuff? Well, I've been on and off doing it all those years. No, I was as I said, I was start talking about this stuff in school when I was ten years old. Well, I have been into several magazines here in Norway. I also a documentary that went on the television in 2000. So, um, yeah, I, I, I've been on and off over the years. Well, there are a lot of people that are, that are experiencing things like that here in Norway, but most people, they don't say anything. Just because of the other people that they can be very hard on them. But I think that with my background uh, in life in general, I am strong enough to deal with it. And I think that also because of I seeing pictures in uh, seeing my life and everything in a bigger scale, bigger picture, then I'm, um, yeah, as the expression are that you, you, you can kill me, but you cannot kill my soul or you cannot kill my idea or my thought or thing like that. So, and I also think that uh, when you know who you are, then you are you will not be that easily to be pushed aside or pushed over. Exactly, exactly. What about the rest of your family? What about, what about acceptance there, and how have you dealt with that? Well, my mother, she has also seen them, so for her, that's not a problem. That's a big uh, deal. But, Does that help? Did that help you ground as such? No. So it, it was not part of the healing. That It wasn't something you just got on with it. It's just something that happens. You're getting on with it and you're just living your life and getting on with things. Yeah. For me, for me, I'm actually, I'm actually not in, interested in the UFO topics. There are so many people that are coming over to me, start talking about this UFO, this UFO, do you know this? Do you know that? I said, sorry, I don't. Because in, in, in the beginning, I'm actually not interested in the UFO topics. It's, it's actually it's just a part of my life. It's the part of who I am. The the UFO group before was highly critical, uh, criticized for keeping the lid on things, and ultimately all the research was just lost. Uh, it's yeah. been a great setback in the UK to have organizations like that who, having after so long been exposed to so much, really put the lid on it. But you you were you've been dealing with the, with the Norwegian. You, you, UFO group, how are they dealing with it? What's happening with them and what's happening in Norway and the other Nordic countries? Well, uh, before, um, there were two UFO groups in Norway. One of them was a little bit more, <coughs> uh, they were trying to be a little bit more skeptics, a little bit more on the science side. <coughs> the yeah, other the one nuts was and bolts, science. as we say. Yeah, and the other part, the other side was more like it seemed. It seemed like they, that they were seeing saucers everywhere, so they were like the opposite. But now they have emerged to one, and the UFO groups in Norway now they they're they not that big anymore. And um, well, I'm I, I'm I'm not a part of it. I'm not a part of the UFO groups in Norway. Well, that says a lot. But how are you and what are the other experiences that you've had? Let's talk about those in the last 20 minutes or so. Or how long? What about these wider experiences you've had which have led you to these um, this different perspectives and this basic pragmatic approach of just getting on with things? Yeah, well, it's... <laughs> It's so, it's so much. Sometimes it's difficult to know where to <laughs> where to start. Um, I think that perhaps I should do the the science thing because uh, I in my in my background I, I don't have any science at all. And um, trust me, if someone told me 30, 40 years back, and 30 years back that well one day you're going to write a book about these topics, I will be laughing at them because well that will be a big joke. But um, the whole process for me started in around, I think it was 95 or something. Um, <clears throat> let's say that you as a grown person, how many questions have you asked in your entire life? What, how long would it, would it take for you if you suddenly were going to get the answers to all the questions? That can take a long time. 
for me, it started with like, um, I, I, I was doing everything as normal in my life, but in the same time, I, I was seeing like this transparent film going in front of my face. <laughs> it was like, it was like uh, when you are ending a movie that you're seeing this script going down, that you're seeing pictures, you're seeing text, you're seeing film, but it wasn't like that you were trying to look into it and see what it actually was. You just uh, acknowledge what it actually was when you were seeing it, and that that was all. And this was going on for almost three months. And when I was done with these three months, I had a severe headache too, but of course it was a lot of information going on. It was like I was, it was not like I, I was sitting there and I was saying that, well, yay, now I know it all. It was more like that you knew it, but it wasn't important anymore. It was like you were feeling like you were on like ground zero. So uh, I'm, now I don't remember how long time it took from me being at this point that I felt like I was like in ground zero. When I, one day I was standing in down in my basement and I uh, was standing there making a wedding dress for a friend of mine. And trust me, I had a deadline and everything. Were and you building, head... were you building a Lego Saturn V at the same time? No, <laughs> no, I wasn't. <laughs> so <laughs> the thing is that when I was standing there making this dress and I had my full focus on this dress, <clears throat> then suddenly I hear this number in my head. And I was saying, okay, hmm, what's this? And then it repeated itself several times. And then in the next moment, then I seeing this, like this what kind of string of number. Purple. One, three, seven, twelve. And then, then, then I suddenly see this string of pearls, and then one more appears. But it look it looks like a DNA string, but without bindings. And then this picture with the strings just keep on growing and growing and growing till it become twelve of them. And then suddenly, it's like someone is taking your con my consciousness out from the back of my head and just drags me out like this, and I am not outside my house or anything like that. I'm being dragged out. So I'm out on outside of absolutely everything. I'm not even talking about a universe. I'm outside of everything. I'm looking into something huge that looks like a donut with, with all the pearls that look, all these strings that are together with this very, very bright light in the middle that is also surrounding all of this. And I felt so humble when I was hanging out there because I knew that this was everything. And then my mind is, my consciousness is like, <coughs> it's like I'm dragged in again. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, that's okay. I'm, yeah. Get to get on I'm, with I'm, it. Yeah. Like, I'm dragged in again and then I'm going into one of the spheres. And then I'm seeing something that looks like an atom and an electron, but it isn't. It's actually how the multiverses were built up. And then I'm following the process of one of these that looks like the electron and what is happening. And then from the Big Bang, and then I'm actually following the whole process afterwards and all the way going back through the systems. And then I'm finally up a little while, then I'm going back to the, then I can actually recognize our own planetary system. And then whoops, I'm back in the basement. It's a little bit like Jodie Foster, no? The Jodie Foster movie? You think about the contact? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's amazing. That really is fantastic what you've described. Yeah. It, it, for, me, for me, that thing there changed my life. Because everything... So for me, I learned that the thing that I was shown, they, they showed me the whole engine first. And afterwards, then they are giving me the downloads here and there about how different kind of parts of it works. And the last thing that I have been dealing with now is that I now I've been going from the absolutely the big picture to the smallest picture ever. So I'm now dealing with the neutral building blocks and how we as humans and how quarks and how everything, how we are moving through everything and how the consciousness and all of it is how all of this is working together. That is what I'm describing in my book. So I'm doing the whole picture. And your book is, and uh, your new book is. 
Well, that one is called a creation where physics and the consciousness meet. That's that's what it's called, and hopefully, there's been I'm a lot sure, of but... yeah. There's been a lot of talk about that bringing his bringing the um, bringing physics to consciousness, and I mean Schrodinger's cat is the as an earlier one, but uh, it, this is an amazing, it's a fantastic book. Yeah, here I will actually describe how everything is working together, and how and even how it looks like together. But the thing is that I'm struggling with now is that I, there are several pictures that I have to make, and I will, I'm trying to make them in 3D, and so it stops a little bit there because I don't know 3D yet, but uh, and I don't have the money for any, to pay anyone that are good at 3D programs. So okay, I guess okay, that... let let's just let's make a shout out right now. What do you want? Maybe there's somebody out there who can help you produce this concept together. And if they want to contact you, how do they contact you? Well, they can contact me on my email if they go if they go through my homepage. Uh, www.katetorvalsen.com then can send me a message there so uh, and there, there's a lot of pictures uh, and there's that, and, and that, you're on facebook as well yeah i'm also on facebook yeah do you want to go through some of the visualizations that you've got on your website or do we want to leave um, that for we can leave that for another part later yeah i think that we shall do that for another part later well, I think it is absolutely fascinating what you've been able to describe. And we're only just scraping, we're just touching the surface of clearly an amazing series of experiences and lifetimes with a great deal of wisdom and forethought and concentration. This is Yeah, so so for me I think that if when I'm saying that my helpers are helping me, for me I'm thinking that perhaps they are helping me to be able to connect with the matrix so much easier. Because for me, I don't need to put myself into any kind of state or anything like that uh, to get stuff. But uh, the problem for me now that after I was getting to the so-called ground zero, I don't have any questions anymore. So for me, the best thing for me is actually to work with science people if they are having questions, things that they are struggling with. And they can ask me, but of course they they have to talk with me without the formulas, but they have to explain what they are doing. And and for me, it's not like... What kind of science people are we talking about here? Well, what sort of the thing that you would like to appeal to? Just names? Do you have any names, ideas, well, research areas quantum in physics? physics? Quantum physics, everything. Because I, I'm covering it all. You, you, even the, out, of, out of this thing that I'm dealing with here, I can even explain time. Well, for me, I, I, I know there's a big hierarchy when it comes to topics and when the professors and all of that and, and the, the, all the school years with school and all of that. I have no school background at all. But I know also that those few times I have been showing some of my stuff, they have been calling from the university and also... They have other science people have wanted to work with me too, and just because of the little tiny bit I'm showing, so uh, for me I, I'm not I'm not hunting them down. I'm just showing my stuff now and then, and they are actually coming after me instead. So for me I think that's great, and I also it's know fantastic. that the, when, and I also know that when my book will be done, I will actually send a copy of my book to several universities all over the globe. And of course, I know there will, half of them probably will love me and the other part will hate me. But um, I will focus on the people that will talk with me. Have you heard of the, the Electric Universe uh, physicists who look at things in quite a different way? They don't uh, really talk about gravity. They talk about the electric field dominance effects in physics and a completely different thing. There's another guy called Nassim Haramein have you heard of him yeah, and, 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 and what do you think of those? I mean, Nassim, uh, pretty advanced, uh, very advanced and different in his thinking, but all along the same sort of lines. It's almost, but what about the Electric Universe people and Nassim? Explain what you feel about those guys. Well, I, I, like, I like the stuff that he's doing, but in the same time, I must also say that I haven't been looking in too much into his stuff either because for me, I don't want to be colored in any kind of way, in the yeah, stuff I think that I'm wise. doing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, also, I have also been talking with other people that are in cosmology and different kind of things, and sometimes they're trying to make me go, to change my mind about certain topics, and 
change it and things like that. And then and I'm trying to explain to them that, you know what, I can't change anything because this is not my stuff. If I ch start to change one thing, how can I, um, how can I trust everything else that I'm getting? And the reason why you or you trying to make me change my stuff is because that the things that since when I try to explain something to them, of course, this is a huge topic. I would just be able to explain a little topic at a time. And the reason why they are trying to make me change my mind is because they are just seeing the tiny little bit and not the bigger pictures that I'm seeing. Uh, wh what do you feel that you'd like to accomplish? Well, um, sometimes it, it, it can be difficult to explain because, uh, as I said, it is, this is a huge topic. <clears throat> and there are several things that you actually have to understand first before you can go to the next level or the next thing to understand. Where do you want to take us in part two and part three or part four and <laughs> or five or six or whatever, whichever way fits by you? And how, how do you want to sort of summarize who you are and what you've achieved to this date in a nutshell? Well, I think that for me, I think that my purpose is to remember, remember who I am, uh, why I'm here, and what I'm supposed to do. And I think that this science book, that's my, that's my legacy. That's the thing that I'm supposed to do because I think that if people start to see the bigger picture, understand what they are, and who they are, then they will start acting differently. They will start living differently. And hopefully that can change the world for the better. Well, that sounds a really good time to quit on this. This is a really good ending on part one. We look forward to you again in part two. And uh, also that, you, that you're that you able to you know, recover. I mean, you look fantastic. You don't look as if you've got any, 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 any flu as such. But I hope this... this... Trust, trust me, I, I, I'm boiling of fever. I am, uh, yeah... It's the evening here, and I'm really warm. So, <laughs> okay. I also take this uh, paracet to get the fever down, but I'm still, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you for enduring through this uh, to do that, and thank you so much, Kate or Katie. Is that okay? Kate. Kate is Kate. fine. Kate. Yeah. Okay. Bye for now, <laughs> and, uh, and 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 take a rest. And thank you so much for coming on on basis to get this ball. It's fantastic what you're doing. It's a wonderful project, and the best of luck to you. Yeah, thank you. It was it was fun to come along. Okay, bye for now. Thank you. <laughs>